warriors in their own words, is brought to you by The Honor Project, committed to putting the heroes of our nation on record. This presentation is dedicated to the brave men and women of the United States Armed Forces. The 1st Cavalry is one of the most decorated combat divisions of the United States Army. The unit was originally formed in 1921 as a horse division. It then served in World War II and the Korean War. In the Vietnam War, the 1st Cavalry took on a new role as an air assault division. Stephen E. Warren served for a year in the infantry in Vietnam but then returned home to train to fly helicopters. Soon, he was back in Vietnam as a Huey helicopter pilot in the 1st Air Cavalry. I thought it was the greatest job in the world. I was, what, 22 years old, just graduated from flight school, and I thought that I was just the hottest pilot in the face of the earth. And I suppose we all did. Uh, you have to have that sort of confidence in your aircraft and the abilities that you have in order to perform the types of missions that we performed. Uh, I, I could not and cannot think of anything that I would rather have done with my life than, uh, than be a, a pilot. And I always knew, even from an, a, a young age, that that's what I wanted to do. And I wanted to do it in the Army. Did you think that at one time, that did, did you imagine yourself in a fixed wing, or did you always think it was going to be a helicopter? Oh, everybody always thought that eventually they'd get fixed wing aircraft. That was a dream of everybody, but uh, I was never lucky enough to get the transition. But I enjoyed helicopters. I, there's, I think, a lot more varied missions that you can do with a helicopter than with a fixed wing, and I had a lot more opportunities to do those missions. Uh, and we could, you know, if you get tired and you want to stop for lunch, you don't have to have a runway. You can just stop. So I, I enjoyed the, uh, the variety, the landings, the takeoffs. Uh, it was always something new, and that uh, requires a lot more skill to fly a helicopter than it does a picture. Like so many young soldiers, Warren felt he was invincible. I think that the answer is, it'll never happen to me. Although I had a feeling when I was in flight school that, yeah, I'm going to go over there, and uh, that's going to be the end of me. But once I got there, no, nah, it's not going to happen to me. I'm too young. You know, you have that feeling of immortality when you're really young. And it happens to other people, but not you. It's, it's the same with a lot of things. And you feel that way until about your last month when you think, yes, I could make it. I might be able to make it. And uh, you, you look very carefully at the missions you draw, uh, what kind of missions they are, and you, and you, get, just, you get a little bit more scared because you have a, the chance that you're going to make it out of there alive. So that's, uh, that's kind of the way we felt. You know, once my first mission, when I flew my first mission, we were into the Ashaw Valley. We lost, what did we lose, 40 helicopters or a few Chinooks. And I realized at that point that my chances of survival were fairly slim, and I didn't, it didn't let it bother me. I knew I wasn't going to survive, so I didn't think about it until that last month. Then I thought about it considerably. How many air assaults did you participate in? I could not begin to tell you. I, I have no idea. We counted sorties, uh, landings and takeoffs, and all I know is I've got 1,200 hours of combat time. And there's different types of time that you log as you're flying. Uh, combat assault, direct combat support, and combat support. And uh, all of my time, almost all of my time was, was combat assault time, so I flew hundreds of them. Can you maybe take us back in the mindset of a 22-year-old? 22, 23 years old. When you, maybe from the, from when you lifted off on a combat air assault, so maybe some of the things you did, some of the things you talked about or, or thought about in the dynamics of, of going into a, a combat air assault, maybe a typical profile? What? I think probably what we were thinking about was very focused, as I remember, all we're thinking about is flying the machine and accomplishing the mission, making sure that nobody got hurt if uh, we could keep from that, keeping everyone out of harm's way. A lot of times we were thinking about McDonald's hamburgers and cheeseburgers, uh, the things back home, and talking about those sort of things to keep our mind off 
what was going to happen because generally the flying was just hours of boredom punctuated by seconds of pure terror and you didn't have time to think about a lot of things other than flying you you couldn't even the fact one of the last things you thought about too was even the bullets uh, you had to concentrate on flying the machine delivering your troops where they were to be delivered and then getting out of there and if you concentrated too much on the bullets flying around uh, you weren't able to do that well You know, the adrenaline rush was certainly there every now and then, but we kind of prided ourselves on being Mr. Cool and sounding cool on the radio. And so we had to keep, you know, in order to foster that image, we had to really, pr to, uh, to sound cool, we had to be cool, we had to, to not let that happen to us. So we just tried to maintain an even strain and uh, think about what it was we were doing. And there are times, though, that it's just a normal everyday mission. It's boring. You have time to daydream. You, you've gotten some altitude. You're cooling off. Just kind of doing dados through the clouds, having a good time. So there are those times too. But during the combat assaults, uh, you've got three radios going. You've got an FM, you've got a UHF, you've got a VHF radio that you're talking on. You're probably listening to AFVN on uh, the ADF, uh, listening to music as you're making your assault. Uh, so you have your hands full. You're flying the aircraft. You've got to make sure that the troops get out. You've got to make sure you get off. And there's uh, 30 or 40 other helicopters all flying around you. There's artillery going in prior, uh, probably 30 seconds prior to touchdown. And then there's aerial rocket artillery as you're touching down. Uh, mini guns going off. Uh, it's a fantastic sight. And that's when the adrenaline gets running. Had, have you ever had to land into a, to an LZ that wasn't quite adequately prepped? As far as I'm concerned, none of them were adequately prepped. You can't, you can't over prep <laughs> an LZ. Yeah, uh, there's one of those times uh, people jumped out of spider holes and shot at us, and luckily they weren't good shots. Yeah, there was many times many times. Uh, I was extremely lucky. I, I took very few rounds. Uh, there was other people that not so so lucky. But there's always those instances. How about the, uh, the survivability of the Huey? The Huey? Yeah, what was it like to fly in it and then how did, how, how did it perform? The Hueys in general is probably at that time was a workhorse of the Army. Uh, I've compared it to the DC-3. It's going to be around forever. It is a great machine. It'll fly with a lot of damage. Of course, then there's that one bullet that'll take it out also, but uh, it was a very versatile machine. Once we got into the H model series, it did what the D model was supposed to do, and we could really perform a mission. Uh, we ran, in fact, we ran a test where our availability was 98% availability for a two-month period in Bravo Company 227th. Uh, the general became our parts supplier. He supplied the parts. Uh, with that kind of a rank, you know, you can get the parts uh, on a priority basis. And as long as we had the parts, those aircraft flew. 98% availability is just in a combat zone. It's unheard of. So it's a good machine. Very uh, pleasant to fly. Uh, particularly at altitude, once you got out of the, the heat, it was kind of nice. You, you talked about earlier, it's all oh. about the grunt. Absolutely. Uh, dropping him off, and, and you, you went back. You, you, didn't, you guys didn't stay. No, no. And that's why I became a pilot. I got tired of being a grunt. Uh, they had the worst job in Vietnam. And we realized when we, we took new guys out, and you could tell the new guys, they had the, the brand new helmet liners and the brand new camouflage helmets. I mean, and it say July 1969 or 68, and it was July 68, so that you know that they were brand new, and we knew where we were taking them, and you know, that was not nice. So we treated them as well as we could. Whenever we'd land to uh, an area with a lot of crunchies in, them, in it, uh, that we would try not to dust them off. We'd try to just take as good care of those crunchies as we could. That's what it was all about. To lose sight of the fact that we were there to support the infantry was to lose sight of your mission. And that's the only reason we were there. The uh, aviation school motto, above the best, doesn't mean that the aviators were better than the best, but that we flew above the best army in the world. And we were there to support 
those people. And that's, that was our total function, was to support those people. And that's what we did, and I think we did it very well. You mentioned in the Ashaw Valley that, um, that you came on your AAA uh, uh, fire. Mm -hmm. um, radar guided. Ra radar guided. Um, what, uh, do you remember any recollections of what, what it was like going through that type of... Uh, when we went first in, went into the, the Ashaw Valley, if I can get this out, um, I was new in country. In fact, those were some of my first missions were into the Ashaw Valley, and some of the worst that I ever encountered all the time I was in Vietnam. And we did draw a lot of fire uh, from anti-aircraft uh, in the initial stages. Uh, like I said, we lost a lot of aircraft due to the anti-aircraft fire. And you learn how to evade it. Uh, we have nowadays technology that tells us it's there. We didn't know it was there until they were shooting at us in those days. Going in and uh, not knowing it's there, then how do you know it's there? Oh, once you get there, they'll let you know it's there. They'll shoot at you, and uh, you can tell it's there. And you can't out-climb it. You know, the loads we were carrying, we couldn't out-climb it, so we just had to evade it, come in low, come in fast, come in through the clouds. You just had to learn how to evade it. And in the initial stages, after three, four, five days, uh, we had it under control. I mean, you still draw fire, but not as intense as the first few days that we went in there. And it was extremely intense. Lost a lot of helicopters, a lot of people. A good portion of the helicopters we lost also were because of accidents, non-combat related. We just didn't know how to handle the aircraft in those high density altitudes, those gross weights, those conditions. Uh, we learned a lot. Although we were superbly trained by Fort Rucker, uh, you can't train a person for that type of an environment without putting them in that environment, and putting them in, in those conditions and letting them do it. And so it cost us a lot of accidents. Like the, the animal helicopter pilots of the first air cav. I think that it was the best unit to fly with. Even when you were out on single ship missions flying your resupply and that sort of, uh, of thing, there was al always other aircraft around. Uh, you never felt alone. The camaraderie was tremendous. Uh, I mean, I've made friends that They'll always be my friends, whether I, I don't see them for 20 years. You know, the next time I see them, we just pick up where we left off, and it's just like there's been no time in between. You make friends for life there, uh, particularly when you have to trust your life to those people, and they have to trust you with their life. Uh, friendships become hard and fast. Did you say you were hit with the AAA? Uh, yeah, I was flying co-pilot in the first stages of my, my tour, second tour in Vietnam as, uh, as a pilot and we took a 37 millimeter round through the tail rotor drive line and the pilot, you know, I can't remember who he was, he's a first lieutenant, did a superb job uh, landing at uh, LZ Stallion and we had to spend the night there with the, with the infantry. And that was the, the reason, I, one of the reasons I went to flight school so I wouldn't have to do that anymore. And there I am stuck there until the next morning they flew us out and gave us another helicopter and just continued on. Can you take us through that? We were just coming into the Ashaw Valley, it was early in the morning, and they started firing at us, and we took around right through the tail rotor. Of course, the aircraft yaws tremendously when you lose tail rotor authority. And uh, the pilot was flying. I didn't know how to handle the situation. He just told me to make a call to the uh, LZ that we were going into, that we were coming in on an emergency landing. They had a dirt strip there already. And uh, he handled the situation great. No further damage to the aircraft. And I'm screaming on the radio, this is White 27. We're going down at... Uh, Stage field six, which my call sign when I was in flight school was white two seven or whatever it was, and stage field six is at Fort Rucker. But uh, <laughs> you revert back to your training, I suppose. But then he told me to go ahead and transmit it outside the aircraft, not just on the intercom. And then I got the call right. So I told him we were coming in, and he did a great job of setting it down. I don't know how he did it or what he did. <laughs> and I didn't know until, I mean, I didn't know how to do that until you know, a year later when I became a uh, flight instructor at Fort Rucker, learned how to do those procedures. And he, just, he was just really good. I don't think that I personally dwelt on warfare. 
Uh, if the truth be known, I think that the pilots who flew the aircraft would go anywhere and do anything as long as they could fly. And it was just unbelievable that somebody would pay you to do it. I mean, that was just icing on the cake. Most of the people were there because they wanted to fly. And that's what we did and did it well. But you were asked to fly in, in, into combat. The thing, the, I, but that's, that's sort of thrilling also. I mean, you know, as Dickens said in The Tale of Two Cities, you know, it's the best of times and it's the worst of times. You see the worst in humanity and you see the best. It brings out the worst and the best, warfare does. And you see people expending 110% to save somebody else. And then you see the other side of it also. But it, uh, it, was a, it, was, it was a good time as well as a bad time. And I have a tendency, as maybe other people do, to dwell only on the good times, not the bad times. The story that keeps coming back to me as I learn more about the first air cab in Vietnam is, is the, the, really just the idea that the, it was months before the division was sent to Vietnam and it was still testing. Things happened fast uh, in, in the first air cab and uh, technology was, was there that uh, was sort of in its infancy as far as helicopters were concerned and the air mobile concept was definitely in its infancy. But in a combat environment, you learn quick. Two months in a combat environment was probably equal to two years flying anywhere else, or in most other cases. Uh, the motivation to learn how to do it correctly, properly, is extremely high, if you know what I mean. They decided to do a mission. We could do it right then. Okay, I want you to take this battalion of troops and put them in here. We're going to take off at this time load up at this point, drop them off at this time. And we were doing it. It, it, it. We didn't take a lot of time to prepare for the missions. We were always prepared for the missions. And once you've done that a hundred times, it's just like falling off a log. It becomes routine. Then there are, of course, the routine sometimes broken. But it was not that difficult to do because we remembered what our mission was, and that was to support the grunt. I loved it when I was able to bring them back from the field. Uh, you know, taking them out when they're new was one thing, but when you get to bring them back, particularly back at the end of their tour and they're going home, that was kind of nice. Or to bring them back to take a shower, those stinking people. Uh, then you know, they loved uh, the helicopter pilots. The, we were there for them. That's what we were there for. It was the sole reason for a lift company's existence was to support the infantry. And uh, when the situation got too bad, we could get them out, uh, which wasn't any fun, but uh, we knew we had to do it. That's when it, when it really got bad. And dropping them into a, a hot LZ was no fun, particularly when you know, you know, it's one thing as a, as from the pilot's perspective, I know I'm going in, I'm going to drop these guys off, they're staying there. I'm going to go back and have a cold beer. That you know you, you're leaving those guys there, and you know how much fire you were drawing while you were dropping them off, and you wonder, well, what's going on with them? And sometimes, as we're flying along on our normal ash and trash resupply missions, we would listen to the radios, uh, to the tactical frequencies, and find out what was going on, and you, you could tell that they were up to their necks in it. I remember one time flying with, I believe it was General Mesner. And his son was a company commander. His call sign was Ace High 6. And he monitored that frequency. So he always knew what was going on with his son. And uh, that was one time when Andy's son was killed during the time we were flying around listening to that radio. That was something. Did you ever have a, a somebody that you had, uh, that you knew? That sure, you certainly. More than more than one. My flight, my stick buddy that I went through flight school with, he took two week leave after flight school. I took a month. When I got in country, he had been dead a, a week. Just 
his first mission they took around right through the mass, 50 cal, and everybody was killed. Uh, about halfway through, Tom Post was killed. He had just transferred out of our unit into another unit. Um, engine shot up, crash, took the cyclic right through the head. Uh, yeah, I could go on and on like that. I feel extremely lucky to be sitting here talking to you. Is that when you felt like maybe every day was a, a free day, or you felt, I mean, it, it, was, it still was difficult to fly, because these are slow and slow targets, too. Oh, we had our door gunners, and we had altitude, and we had limited exposure times, and that's what we tried to keep to a minimum was our exposure times. Uh, it's a big target, but I've had people jump right out in front of me, I mean, not 20 yards in front of me, and, and shoot a full 30-round clip of AK-47 at me and not hit me. So, you know, you, you find these little pamphlets, that uh, the papers that the Viet Cong and the NVA put out on how to shoot at helicopters and how to lead the helicopter. Well, I was sitting on the ground, so I think this guy led me, uh, and I'm glad he took his training to heart. There's a little pamphlet out that showed a picture of an 086, and it said, if you see this, and then you turn the page, this is what's coming behind it, and it showed a picture of a cobra. So they, they had to, they learned their lessons as quickly as we did. They had to. Can you take us through that one more time? Uh, you, you said that they, they did a book and, and they said to lead the helicopter. Uh, when when you're firing at a moving target, you have to lead it because of the time from the firing to the time of the impact. So you have to lead your target. So, you know, they, they took that training to heart, evidently, that they have to shoot in front of the helicopter in order to hit it. You know, I was, just happened to be sitting on the ground when he did that. If I'd have been moving, he might have hit me. But generally, it was just boring, having fun, flying a helicopter. Beautiful country, beautiful country. Uh, probably from the pilot's perspective, it was a beautiful country. Uh, down walking through that triple canopy jungle, or not jungle, rainforest, in uh, high humidity, immersion feet, rotten crotch, bugs. Yeah, that wasn't any fun. Uh, pilot. The pilots, I think, the pilots had it much easier than anybody else in Vietnam. We always flew back in the evening and had a, a cot and a hot meal. Uh, when we were resupplying these guys, we were dropping off sea rats. And that's what they were eating. And they were sleeping in the rain, in the mud, in the muck. They had it rough. Those, the infantry is the, the ones who had it rough. The infantry, artillery, those, those sort of people. We, we were the prima donnas. And I don't mind. You know, I you know, I spent my year doing that, and then I went to flight school. It seems to me like, uh, like as a pilot, you, you spent a lot of your time insulated from the war. Besides the time you were shot down, did you ever get, were there ever any experiences where you came face to face with, with the reality of what was really going on? Oh, absolutely. In May of 1968, when Camp Evans' ammo dump blew up, sure. I mean, you face uh, your own mortality at times like that. Uh, our aircraft, we probably lost all of them. I mean, some sort of battle damage from the ammo dump blowing up. We took uh, six or seven 122 millimeter rockets and they went right into the ammo dump. And uh, yeah, very, very difficult time. Um, <clears throat> we lost everything. We lost everything we owned. Everything burnt to the ground, blew up. Had nothing left. And within a week, we were conducting combat operations again, total combat operations, full company, full aircraft, full people. We didn't lose any people, no people we were able to get out. But we lost all of our tents, personal possessions, everything. In a week, conducting combat operations again. During the Vietnam War, U.S. Army soldiers served for 12 months, then rotated home. This one-year rotation policy had its pros and cons. If I were setting policy for the Army, one of the policies that I would change, that one-year rotation, I think that was one of our major mistakes. About the time you're ready to leave country and go home, and I mean, you thanked God that you were ready and you, I mean, that you were able to go home. 
was a time you really knew what you were doing. And then somebody else came in to take your place, and he had to learn the same process all over again. And you can tell people, and you can show people, but until they do it, they don't know how to do it. And that was one of the biggest mistakes that we made was a one-year rotation. If we had not have done that, I don't know, it would have made a, a great difference. Of course, your chances of survival were a lot less. Did you, uh, did you formulate separate opinions about uh, the NBA and the BC as, a, as an adversary based on your combat experience? While I was there, no. They were both formidable, and I think we underestimated them tremendously. Part of that's good, part of that's bad. But no, no, somebody shooting at me was somebody shooting at me, and uh, I didn't distinguish between NVA and Charlie. They were all one and the same to me. Uh, I've seen instances where the NVA were not as well trained as Charlie, and where Charlie was not as well trained as the NVA. It's just probably an individual type unit thing. Some were good, some were bad. They could all kill you. I didn't distinguish at all. The Bell AH-1 Cobra was a new high-performance attack helicopter introduced during the Vietnam War. That was kind of nice when we got the Cobras in country. Uh, we would be flying on our combat assault missions and we'd be flying in a flight of 40 aircraft and the Cobras would be flying around us and everything. And they initially, in the initial stages of the Cobra deployment in Vietnam, did not have air conditioning. Now, it sounds funny to have air conditioning in an aircraft, but uh, it got so hot in the cockpit of that Cobra, 140, 150 degrees, that people were passing out. So they had to put air conditioning in there. They'd be flying alongside of us, and they'd pull up next to us, and we'd look over and see them, and you could see that air conditioner blowing that cool air out there, and you could see their Coke sitting there getting cooled off. And, They'd give us a little wave. So we were kind of jealous of that because we're sitting in a cockpit that's probably 120 degrees all the time in the sweat box. All that plexiglass around you. Well, plus the gunship Hueys were so much. The idea is to get ahead, but actually that really just slowed everybody down because of the, the drag. And the Cobras came in and weren't they so much faster? They oh, they're, they're much ahead, quicker. Faster? Much quicker. How did and they, they help the, uh, the cab mission or the air or the assault? Oh, in a number of ways. One by, oh, I was almost going to use a word I can't use, uh, by providing close, 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 close combat support. I, I swear that I've seen rockets go through my skids. I know they haven't, but it was that close. I've been mesmerized as I make my approach, and they're firing mini guns and they're firing rockets. It's such a fantastic sight to see all this ordnance going off, and it's all to keep Charlie or the NVA suppressed so that you can get in there drop off your troops and get out without getting hurt. And uh, I just loved it when they flew with us. Of course, you had your own machine gunners also providing suppression. But that's one way they did it. And uh, they also went out on their own and uh, with an OH-6, a hunter-killer team, and uh, looked and looked and looked for the enemy and hoped they didn't find them. Or once they found them, then they could do something about it. When you look at the early footage of the H-13, and then and, and the, the Huey gunships, and you compare that to the OH-6, mm -hmm. and then the the Cobra backing them up. It almost looks like it's just too like much classier a team. Uh, yeah, more, more the aerodynamic. OH yeah, the OH-6 is a great machine. It's a very very versatile aircraft, very quick to respond, uh, had power. I was not rated in it, but uh, everybody that flew it just loved it. And a very it was a smooth aircraft to fly. And small, they could get into small places and, and, and look around and, and, and find what they were looking for. And then get the heck out so the Cobras could come in and do their job. Recon by fire seems like a silly way to fight a war. Well, I'm not fond of it. It's not my favorite thing either. I mean, recon by fire, and most of the tactics that are used in aviation are basic infantry tactics. Uh, recon by fire being one of them. Uh, everything's a basic, uh, a basic concept, but we use it in aviation also. Can you maybe elaborate on that? Uh, suppression, covering fire, one up, one back, leapfrog operations, uh, that sort of thing. It, it's all squad tactics, 
company tactics, uh, basically the same, except that we're doing it in an aircraft. Mutual support, I think, is the name of the game. General Putnam was saying that the one thing that uh, the helicopter gave the Army was that, and he said, he, he paused and he said, no, no, what I'm about to say is very, very fundamental, yet it's, it's far-reaching. He said what it meant was you no longer had to have a reserve as a commander. Yeah, we didn't keep anything in reserve as far as I remember. Of course, I'm working on down here, and he's working up at this level, but I, but that's that's true. Uh, I don't see that you would have to have a reserve because the mobility is there. You can move this unit, move this battalion in a matter of an hour or two to another location. So the mobility was there to do that. And it allowed you to use 100% of your assets and not keep anything in reserve. And that, of course, is a different type of a warfare there, too. It's not like the Second World War. Stephen Warren holds surprisingly fond memories of his time in Vietnam. I remember having a good time. I, I know that sounds out of context and out of place, but like I said earlier, you know, most of the people who were, were pilots would have done that. They were just lucky to get to be able to get paid for it. They'd have done it for free. Plus, not only did we get paid for it, we got flight pay for doing it. I mean, we got paid extra for doing that. Uh, the people who flew the aircraft were truly dedicated to aviation and to their mission of supporting the infantry. And they'd do it under any circumstances. We had a good time. We had a, a lot of good camaraderie. And we had a lot of bad times. But we, you know, like I say, we try not to dwell on those. But ours was a different world than the grunt. And we were flying over the top of it for the most part. And, and it looked much more beautiful than it really was. Uh, that is a beautiful country. Uh, I, I don't know if you've ever been there or flown over it, but it's it's just beautiful. And I, in fact, I'd like to go back there as a tourist. Uh, it's just such a beautiful place, and and we got to see more of it, and we got to be in more different places and more parts of the country than the grunt did, and flew more varied missions. So uh, most of the time, it, it was most of the time boring, and uh, that was fine with me. But I was building up hours, learning how to fly, being the best helicopter pilot that I could be. And that's what we concentrated on. Uh, you know, we tried not to think too far into the future. I, you know, I was so young, and you know, I don't know how you were when you were young, but I had a hard time thinking more than 30 minutes into the future when I was young. And that's about the way we thought. We thought to the end of this sortie, the end of next sortie, we didn't dwell on tomorrow, the next day. We, hmm. I guess we lived for that day, that time, that minute, and whatever happened, happened. And proud to be a part of it. And it's hard for me to say in public because of the public's perception of the Vietnam veteran, but the people who we were supporting, the people who were my friends, the people that we worked with, were just your basic cross-section of society, and they were good people. Had a good time. After after uh, the Quezon era, were you involved in any other missions? Or, or large after campaigns? Quezon, the uh, division moved in total to the Phuc Vinh area. And in fact, I was flying as co-pilot for General Forsythe's pilot. Uh, Wade Kern was his instructor pilot. Generals had to fly with uh, instructor pilot. And as a matter of fact, General Foresight wasn't rated as an Army aviator. Uh, Wade Kern was, was in the process of training him. And uh, General Ewell, the Corps commander, came up, said, George, I'm listening on the intercom. Uh, I want you to move your division down south. And they started talking about it. And he says, OK, I'll start tomorrow morning. This is about 5 o'clock in the evening. Well, we landed, and I went back into my company and says, hey, we're moving tomorrow morning. Everybody says, yeah, sure, uh-huh, you bet. Go to bed. Midnight, they woke us up and we moved out. Uh, the next day, they were moving our combat vehicles, our trucks, our people. The Navy pulled up in their ships, loaded them. Uh, we were conducting combat operations the next day on a large scale, uh, at least uh, brigade size operations in the 10 worst base areas in Vietnam. It's fantastic to see that type of an operation 
go so smooth. I mean, I'm sure it wasn't smooth to most of the people. Well, we just hopped in our helicopters, flew 500 miles south, and continued our mission. I've heard it's the equivalent of moving a small town. Not so small. I don't know how many aircraft we had in the division. I, I mean, I have no concept. I mean, I was just low life scum at that time. Probably 250, and all the supporting equipment, all the trucks, all the infantry, uh, all the artillery. And we were down the next day, combat operations, 500 miles south. Unheard of feat. You know, you, you can compare that, I think, with Patton's march through Germany. Well orchestrated, good leadership, good pilots, good leadership. Did you ever hear any of the, the tales from the Chinook pilots? No, no, really. You know, we, we were in our own little world. You know, we were Yui pilots, and there were Cobra pilots over here, and there were Chinook pilots over here. And Chinook pilots, for the most part, I think, in my tour, were second tour aviators. They got a transition to more sophisticated, complicated, bigger target than uh, what we were flying. You didn't call it a helicopter. <laughs> I, I didn't. I thought it was pretty darn big. <laughs> And all of a sudden, the Yui, as big as it is, uh, looks a lot smaller in comparison. I think if I was a gunner, I'd rather, much rather shoot at a big helicopter than a small one. I was talking to a, a Yui gunner. In fact, he's in the show, and he was talking about when rounds would go through the, the mag... Uh, I forget what they said that, that it was made out of. The magnesium? Magnesium. He said when rounds would go through, they would make a static sound on, on the intercom that everybody could hear, mm -hmm. and you knew the sound. And he said all you'd want to do is ball yourself up and try to be small. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that I ever heard it on the intercom as we were taking rounds, but I mean, we could feel it and we could see it. And you did. You, you, all of a sudden you tried to get real small and get behind. We wore uh, armor vests and I turned my pistol around to where it sat in my lap and I put uh, my uh, flak vest in the chin bubble a lot of times. Because uh, those don't provide any protection. Chin bubble and and you know one tenth of an inch of metal protecting you from from bullets it just doesn't work so you wore as much as you could and you pulled your armor seats forward to make sure that you were protected and I've had bullets mouse around in the armor seat and they do protect you great I, I love the Kevlar and don't the Hueys also have windows down by your feet? that's the chin bubble and that's why I put uh, can you maybe take us through, take us through that again so maybe we'll get a condense that, that thought a little uh, as far as the chin bubble? Yeah, uh, what, what, the fact that it was there and what you did to protect yourself? Well, the UE provided absolutely zero protection as far as uh, from from gunfire. I mean, the thinnest, uh, the skin is very thin. Uh, plexiglass breaks out real easy. It doesn't stop bullets, so you'd wear uh, a ceramic armor vest. Uh, I put my, a lot of times, would put my flak vest in the chin bubble to stop bullets. I would bring my pistol, you know, my pistol belt around to where it sat in my, my crotch, uh, and I would pull the sides of my armor seat forward as far as they would go so that I was protected as much as possible. Yeah, so, you know, you try to keep yourself protected the best you could, and there were ways. Big, the best way, minimum exposure time. Almost everybody to the man says that uh, the, the most uh, uh, exciting time was, was at the moments before you actually hit the LC because everybody went low and or treetop level. Oh, I can remember guys flying low enough that they they weren't watching what they do and knock over a gravestone. Yeah. Now, you know, it's amazing that that we survived at all because of some of the stupid things we would do. You know, you, generally the missions were extremely boring, and so you would do things to 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 remove that boredom, and you'd fly low level unnecessarily go out and pop smoke in the clouds to see if you could color the clouds and, and hover around, try to make an approach to a cloud. And, and that's, it's nice to be able to get up there at that altitude and play and, and cool off, and, and it was a respite. <clears throat> but going into the LZs, particularly if it's a hot LZ, yeah, the adrenaline starts flowing. You get hunched over the controls like this. Yeah, and it's a different world. And you, you if it was a one-ship LZ and you got 40 ships in each flight, you've got three flights going into one LZ and Orange 1 goes in and Orange 2's coming in behind him as he takes off and Orange 2 calls, Orange 2 drawing fire. And every time you draw fire, you let everybody know. Well, then Orange 3 would go in 
he wouldn't say anything. Orange Four would go in. Orange Four is drawn fire. Well, pretty soon you realize it was every other aircraft that was drawn fire. So you'd be counting back. Now, see, that's Orange Flight's got 40 aircraft. I'm in white flight, and there's 40 aircraft, and I'm white seven. Now, am I going to draw fire or not? And you're trying to figure out if you're going to draw the fire or not. So, I mean, you're always thinking. A number of folks have also uh, said that the, uh, the, the MBA particularly were extremely disciplined to the point where they wouldn't buy off on the first ship because uh, they, they'd rather let two, wait for two or three, and then they pounce. Yes, that's been known to happen. You go into an LZ that you think is cold, and of course we we considered every LZ hot. But you know you go in and think, well, we're going to get away with this one, and then about the time everybody sets down, then all hell breaks loose. Yeah, that's true. With the busy fall season just around the corner, you might be looking for wholesome, convenient meals for jam-packed days. Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit can help you fuel up fast with chef-prepared, dietitian approved ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time, eat well, and stay on track with your healthy lifestyle. Too busy with your end-of-summer goals to cook but want to make sure you're eating well? With Factor, skip the extra trip to the grocery store and the chopping, prepping, and cleaning up too while still getting the flavor and nutritional quality you need. Factor's fresh, never-frozen meals are ready in just two minutes, so all you have to do is heat and enjoy, then get back to crushing your goals. Level up with Gourmet Plus options prepared to perfection by chefs and ready to eat in record time. Treat yourself to upscale meals with premium ingredients like broccolini, leeks, truffle butter, and asparagus. With Factor, you can rest assured you're making a sustainable choice. We offset 100% of our delivery emissions, source 100% renewable electricity for our production sites and offices, and feature sustainably sourced seafood in our meals. This August, get Factor and enjoy eating well without the hassle. Simply choose your meals and enjoy fresh, flavor-packed meals delivered to your door, ready in just two minutes, no prep, no mess. Head to factormeals.com slash warriors50 and use code warriors50 to get 50% off. That's code warriors50 at factormeals.com slash warriors50 to get 50% off. seems like with a lot of patties, rice patties, and, and populated villages, and you don't quite know who the enemy is or, or where they're at. Um, what were the, some of the dynamics of going into a village uh, quickly and, and surprising them, too? Though, like, Are you talking like eagle flights, where they go in and clear a village, uh, search and destroy missions? I don't like that term. Uh, I, again, from a pilot's perspective, not much different. Uh, the terrain's different, so you have to think about the landing. You might have to land on a dike. You may not be able to even touch down at all. You may have to hover above the uh, rice paddy, drop the troops off. They go in, we're out. Again, we're out. They're still there. Five minutes later, ten minutes later, fifteen, whatever, you know, we may be coming back in to pick them up. Nothing happened, or we may be able to, may be coming back to load the body bags on. So, you know, it's just from our standpoint, just another mission. Uh, again, you know, I mean, you have different things that go through your mind as far as the mission itself, but it's just another mission. From my perspective, you know, uh, from a commander's perspective, uh, the support, uh, I'm sure, would be totally different. You know, as, as I progressed in rank, I, I became more involved in other things other than just flying a helicopter because uh, as an Army aviator, you are just that. You're an aviator, and you're not just a pilot, and you're responsible for more things than just being able to fly a helicopter. My, as a W-1, that's all they expect you to do, but they expect you to do it well. That's the difference between a first lieutenant, or excuse me, a second lieutenant and a W-1. Nobody expects that lieutenant to be able to do anything right, where they expect that W-1 to be able to fly that helicopter. Is there anything else you can, you can uh, shed light on in regards to the fact that, uh, like this one guy said, Marvel said that uh, our aviators are grunts that learn to fly, and that's what he goes. This isn't a knock on the Air Force, but from my perspective, that's absolutely a true statement. Uh, when I was going through flight school, I would think that over, uh, way over half of the people in flight school had prior service. They they were NCOs. They had been grunts in Vietnam, 
or had been in some sort of, of service uh, for a while. I had three or four years service before I went to flight school. Couldn't have had that much. Yeah, three or four years. Uh, I joined when I was 18 and I went through flight school, graduated when I was 22. So, yeah, we, a lot of us had uh, prior service, prior experience, and it was invaluable to us as an aviator because you understood the workings of the Army and how things happen, and, and, and it made you a much better aviator. But uh, prior service w was really a help. It was, it made it, I think it made it more difficult to get through flight school because you had to take so much garbage from what we considered garbage, and in retrospect, it wasn't garbage. It was exactly the training we needed. Uh, but at the time, you had to put up with a lot of what we considered harassment. Uh, you know, anytime you're going through a school environment like that, you think it's harassment. But it was actually good training, attention to detail type stuff. And it was harder for us, particularly some of the people who had been NCOs and who were used to receiving respect and not being treated like low-life scum. And sometimes that's the way we were treated in flight school, uh, particularly going through the officer training portion of it where they want to push you as far as you can go and they want you to be treated as bad as you can be treated so that when you're in command and you're in charge you know what it's like when you issue an order. Fort Rucker, didn't they also, uh, toward the end, they actually put you to the test and took you into austere conditions and gave you more, uh, more battle related type uh, jobs, didn't they? Maybe you're speaking of the tactical training that we received during the last phases of our training at Fort Rucker. And I was a, uh, an instructor pilot at Fort Rucker for four years, and I worked with the Department of Tactics. And that's where we taught those individuals in flight school in their last month of training. They were trained up to that point to be a pilot from point A to point B. Anybody can do that. Then we trained them to be a combat aviator. Taught them as much as we could as far as the, the doctrine and the tactics that we employ how to fly the aircraft in those environments, what to expect, and trained them and, and told them about the conditions that they could expect the best we could. And they were well trained, but you still, until you're there, until you do it, you don't know how to do it. And you really, you learn how to fly the aircraft. In a combat environment, you learn how to fly the aircraft. Uh, when I got back, I learned how to be an aviator. I think I was more of a pilot in Vietnam, and after that I became an aviator. Once you have to teach somebody else how to fly, that's when you learn how to fly. I'd say it's about 95% knowledge and 5% control touch, but when you're flying 1,200 hours a year in the most austere, severe conditions that you can find anywhere in the world, you really know how. You learn the control touch. You learn how to handle the aircraft through the full range of its capabilities. More of an intuitive type of model. Yes, intuitive. But knowledge is what will keep you alive. It's an interesting question. I, uh, any ribbons or awards that I ever got, I spent one time in an award ceremony and I refused to do it after that. And it caused me a lot of problems. But I just didn't feel right. And so, you know, they'd just give them to me. Even, even after Vietnam, when I was in the 2nd of the 10th Air Cab at Fort Ord, uh, Colonel would just call me in his office and here, Steve, here's your, your medal because I know you don't want to do this. I, I, I don't like that. I mean, for other people, I, and I, I, it's fine, and there's nothing wrong with it. It's just it wasn't for me, uh, and I love to see other people being rewarded for what they do. But for me, you know, I was just, I was just there. I, I wasn't doing anything extraordinary. I was just your basic uh, Joe Bag of No Nuts helicopter pilot. Now I was good. Don't get me wrong. I was the best, but I was just there. We were all good. So I didn't do anything that everybody else didn't do. It is an interesting system, though, that uh, I mean, that's the only thing the military really has, is that uh, you give somebody yeah. something they can put on the 
you know, from that's really the only reward system, mm -hmm. one of the only real, and it's a lasting thing. That's part. It is. It is a lasting and thing. That's how you promote it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they've got to do it. Somebody had to take one of these. Things. Well, it's not that I'm not proud of them. It's just that I don't. I don't like to say that I've got this award. Or I've got that award. And I don't have that many. There's a lot of people that were really into that sort of thing. Uh, it just. I don't care, you know. But I am proud that, that I received those awards. Yeah, because it is recognition from your peers that you're doing something right. But even at an early age, I was able to feel that I was doing a good job within myself. I knew when I was doing a good job and when I wasn't. And as long as I pleased myself and my standards, and probably anybody's standards are, are pretty high for themselves. And so as long as I lived up to my standards, I was okay. Is there anything else that you might want to uh, uh, elaborate on in, in regards to the first air cab and, and the fact that they fought, they fought in all four tactical zones and uh, they took more casualties than any other division in the Army? Oh, I didn't know that. Um, yeah, they took more casualties. They were more, more, more decorated than any other division in the Army. Well, I'm going to have to say a prayer of thanks again tonight for, for making it through the times that I did, I guess. I didn't realize that they took more casualties. I know that we conducted a lot of combat operations. I mean, every single day somebody was conducting a combat operation, and, and there was always something going on. A first air cab, as far as I'm concerned, I, I, in fact, most of my career in the service, 21 years, as an aviator was in cab units. First air cab, uh, 14th. Armored Cavalry Regiment uh, in, the, in the Air Cav within that regiment, uh, the 2nd to the 10th Air Cav. So, I mean, that, that's what I did, and that's what I considered myself as an Air Cavalry pilot. And Air Cavalry is a way of life. I mean, it's not just a religion, it's a way of life. Uh, and you get caught up in that Air Cav concept. And it is different than lift or Although that's what I was doing in the first air cab was lift, but it, you know it's, it's a different concept. It's mobility. First air cab was probably the best unit for a pilot to be in in Vietnam. Never by yourself. Even when you're out single ship, uh, there was other people around. Uh, if something happened to you, in fact, I remember when we we were crashing and crashing through the trees, and I, the, when I, I hit the top of the trees, I could swear that I looked out to my front and saw an 086 waiting for me. And I just made my mayday call two minutes earlier. I mean, we were really high. It took us a couple minutes to get to smack the ground, fall down, and go boom. And he was waiting there on the ground for me. That's a great feeling to have somebody right there when something happens. And we were out on a single ship mission. Made my call. Bam! They're right there, Johnny on the spot, always right there. Did you? Uh, that was comforting. Can you tell us how many times you crashed? Just once. Uh, we took around through the engine. And uh, we fell down and went boom. Uh, I was flying a classified aircraft it's called a JUH-1 Delta J is for experimental like electronic. And uh, the engine quit. And we came down fast. And at my experience level, I just kind of screwed it up at the bottom. Uh, I'm not sure that I could have even to this day do a, a real good job with it, but I probably could do better. Uh, the aircraft was so heavily overloaded. We were extremely high density altitudes, uh, uh, real hot and uh, going into a, a confined area. Almost made it, uh, but we had a little bit of ground run and the big space loop DF antenna on the front of the aircraft caught a tree stump and rolled us over. Uh, today I might be able to do a little bit better job, but maybe even more than just a little bit. My experience level was low. You know, how, how do you teach somebody to do an auto rotation with an over gross weight aircraft with a density altitude of 6,000 feet? Well, you, you can't teach them that. That's something you know you have to learn. Well, I can do it now, at least a little bit better. How many other people were in your craft? It was full of electronic equipment. There were myself, my co-pilot, and two operators in the back. We didn't have any guns or anything. A lot of electronic equipment. Did they make it? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No one was hurt. The only person got hurt was me. When we rolled over, we rolled over on the left side, and I was in the left seat, on, excuse me, we rolled over on the right side, and I was in the left seat, so I was way up here, and when I unbuckled, I fell down on my co-pilot and banged my knee. But uh, there's a picture on the wall there of me standing there by my wrecked helicopter, real proud of what I did, huh? <laughs> I think I was more proud that we survived. So what, Any landing that you walk away from is a good one. Well, 
But what you're saying is one bullet took down your whole hill, you know? It can do that, absolutely. Absolutely. Sure, right through the hot end, I guess. Uh, or, you know, sometimes, like, I, I understand that, that Fred Ferguson, when he, for the action that he got the Medal of Honor, took hundreds of rounds, and that he, it, you know, he kept flying, it kept flying, and when he landed it, it wouldn't start again, and they had to put it on a truck and take it back and get it fixed. Uh, his hydraulics were out, everything was out. But a U.E. is an extremely delicate machine in some instances, and just a bulldog in other situations where it'll fly and fly and fly and fly and fly when you wouldn't think that it would. It took 10 years before the, uh, the vets were finally welcomed home. I mean, that, that's, that's a matter of, that's, that's recorded history. I mean, it's, I, I, it just blows my mind when they finally dedicated the monument in 82. You know, you, you said that it was 10 years after we got back before we were welcomed home, and I think maybe that was because of a misconception on the public's part of the Vietnam War. And I see that war as every bit as patriotic as any other war America has ever fought in. Our country asked us to do something, and some people they asked through the draft system, some people volunteered, but we were asked to do something to fulfill a responsibility that we have to our country by serving in the armed forces, and we did that. It was every bit as much patriotic as any other war. We, it's just another form of taxation, in some cases a severe form of taxation. Some gave all but it was just as much patriotic. And I think also the public's image of the veteran himself is a bushy-haired, mustache, beard, half of a uniform, protesting everything and anything out there is, is, a, is a misconception. Also, 95% of the Vietnam veterans are just like every, every Joe Bag of Donuts you see on the street. Uh, a normal everyday businessman contributes to society. Uh, you wouldn't know that he was a Vietnam veteran. Uh, Ninety-five percent of them. But that five percent is what has made the image for the Vietnam veteran, and, and that's unfortunate. Anything else you want to say about the, the air cab, or, or what, what we should take from this interview? Maybe in closing, parting, last chance to. Oh my goodness, I can't think of anything now. You kind of put me on the spot here. I think I've said everything. I've talked more about it today than I've talked about it in years. Air cab, all the way. That's all I got. We hope you've enjoyed this presentation of Warriors in Their Own Words. This program was created and produced by The Honor Project, Heroes of Our Nation on Record. Narrated by Bill Ratner. This production is copywritten by Heroes of Our Nation on Record, Incorporated. Any unauthorized broadcast, public performance, or copying is a violation of applicable laws. Hello, this is Gary Chahot welcoming you to check out the French History Podcast. Our main show covers the history of France from the first humans until present, if you liked Mike Duncan's The History of Rome and wanted a similar program covering the land of beauty, culture, and love, we are exactly that. We also host world-renowned scholars who have delivered guest episodes on their specialties, including 18th century pirates, revolutionary booksellers in 20th century Paris, the special friendship between the Marquis de Lafayette and Thomas Jefferson, and numerous others. Learn what you love and listen to the French History Podcast today.